I would like to share a few quick things with you. But before all, I want to say it. <laughs> you know, I watch these videos, our church is flooding. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I feel like the devil is really something, isn't he? You know, when the devil cannot stop your celebration, he will rain on it. But we are rainproof. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? When the devil cannot stop your party, he tried to make it rain. But we are rainproof. Because even in the rain, we will celebrate Jehovah. Even in the rain, we are wet, but we will give him thanks. Are we not still having church? Yes. I say, are we not still having church? Yes. Are we still not having church? Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. You know, when I watched the video, Pastor JB sent me and Bishop Michel, I was in Montreal in a prayer meeting, and people were wondering, why did it become so dangerous suddenly? Because in the prayer meeting, I was at this level. When I watch this video, I, I begin to have tears. My tears are not too far. And uh, I, felt, I felt so angry, to tell you. I was very violently angry. I feel like, is this is our church sinking with water like this? Dripping with water? My spirits clam up to my throat. And people, what do, why is he crying now? This is material, of course. That is replaceable. But I was angry because I wanted to release some stuff. I feel like, devil, you're really real. You're not just a theology, a theology or doctrine or something we are saying. You are really real. In other words, brothers and sisters, we have an adversary. Yes. And it's not your wife. <laughs> <laughs> or your husband. We have an adversary. Who's roaming like a lion. Seeking whom he might devour. I said, you will not devour anybody here in the name of Jesus. You can make it rain, you can make it flood. But as for us... Standing here at the children of Jehovah, washed by the precious blood of Jesus, we declare the victory of Christ over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. This was what we call in demonology and spiritual warfare, demonic retaliation. And I remember after our first fruit, I came to visit the intercession and I told them, Keep praying, continue the fast. Intercessor, you remember? I said, continue the fast. Don't stop, don't stop fasting. Let the whole church stop fasting, but you keep fasting because demonic retaliation. That's what happened to Prophet Elijah. After the revival of Elijah, Jezebel showed up, Elijah ran away. I said, the devil, we are not running away. We're going to still have church. It doesn't matter if it's in the snow, or it doesn't matter if it's in the corner, or in the parking lot, but we're still going to sing a song to our God and to our Savior. Amen. Because he has been too good to us. Amen. I give thanks to God for your life because you are dangerously, you are dangerously strong. Amen. I like to put the word dangerous. You are dangerously strong, people. You are dangerously strong. You are dangerously committed to God. You really know the God in whom you believe. You know him. Congratulations for being attacked by the devil. <laughs> Congratulations. Because you see, if you carry nothing, you have no issue with anybody. But when you carry something and you're going somewhere, the devil will try to throw all his little game and scheme around. But as for us and our house and our family and this church, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to thank all the leadership for standing and the people gathering together to deal with this in a very effective way. God is with us. And if God is with us, and if God is for us, yes. if God is for us, yes. 
please tell me the rest. If God is for us, if God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us? I feel like sometimes I like to see this because it wakes us up and makes us know this is not just an easy flowing and rapping and skiing. This is a serious journey. It's a prophetic journey that has hurdles that we have an opposition and a resistance. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But we have overcome. Amen. We have overcome. Amen. Thank you. I want also to tell you something profound before I preach short. I send you a video to say thank you for the first fruit. You, you have been such amazing people. Phenomenal. Every one of you, individually as a family, you are amazing people. Thank you for trusting in God. Thank you for relying on him. This journey of life is a journey of faith. Amen. And without faith, you cannot, it's impossible to please God. It takes faith to please God. And faith is expressed when you do something that's not easy. I don't need faith to go and uh, shower. But it takes faith to give something to God that you need so badly. It doesn't take faith to give out of your extras. But there's no human being in this house who gave out of his extras. Every person I've given out of what they needed the most. And that's what is pleasing to God. The Lord spoke to my heart. Commitment is great. Sacrifice is greater. Amen. What we achieve by His grace is sacrifice. It's not commitment. Committed people cannot do this. It's out of the league. Completely. But we did it together as a family. Amen. And that's the way God wants us to achieve vision. As a family. As a family. Say it please. As a family. No matter how deep the valleys are, we need to be together. Amen. No matter how high the mountains of glories are, we need to be together. That what please God. It's not an achievement to raise a big amount. The greatest miracle here is that we stood together as a family. Don't look at the number. The greatest miracle is that we stood as a family. That's what is the miracle. In other words, it's not one individual who did it. Is every one of us, each person according to his grace, to his level of faith, and what has been entrusted to him. And therefore, God rewards is always based on level of grace, on the capacity, and what has been entrusted to you. So I come here on the behalf of God to say thank you for trusting God. Amen. Cross point. In 2007, I had a dream. We were still on Center Street at the older church. And uh, I was standing at the window, those older windows that we used to have there. And I was watching outside. And I saw a crowd of people. They were coming from everywhere in, from the city. East, south, people were rushing to churches in Calgary. And they will go to a church and the church was closed. Then they go to one, this one is closed. Then they go, yeah, this one is closed. And they were, 
some now were running coming to our church. And I was standing in our own church, looking through the window, seeing all this stuff, and I knew our own church were closed. So I ran to the door trying to open. When I touched the doors, I woke up. I understood in my heart that there is a time coming and the time is really close where this world will run coming looking for a refuge. I'm not talking because of a tsunami but because of the oppression, the depression and the wickedness of what they have been enduring. People are tired. The world is tired. They are just trying to do whatever they can do to ease and kind of build up some fake dreams for themselves to have peace for a little bit, for a short time. That's why they will do drug. Because they are tired. So let me do drug so I can have some joy and some happiness. So I can hypnotize myself a little bit because... I have no hope. I'm hopeless. My life worth nothing, so let me shoot myself. My life worth nothing, so let me sell my body. My life worth nothing, so let me do anything for a little bit of peace. People are tired. Your boss who is not born again at work is tired. Your co-labor who is not born again at work is tired. Your neighbor who is not born again is tired. You know why I know? Because even as church people under this grace is not easy. How much more the people out there who are not operating under this grace? Yes. People are tired. Because one day they dream that they will achieve this. And after all this year, they are still here. There is a distance between their dream and expectation and the reality of their life and achievement. And they get depressed and discouraged. They throw the towel. Oh, well, who told you they throw the towel? When you see somebody begin to sell themselves as a prostitute or a male prostitute or a woman prostitute or shooting themselves, they are throwing the towel. You need to know how to read prophetically the habit and the conduct of individuals. They are throwing the towels. People are tired. But the church have not taken its place. We are just gathering here among four walls, happy, fortunate to be envied, warm up, happy, jumping, having fun in the Holy Ghost, being slain, fire, fire, and it's all good. But the world is tired, and the world is tired, and the world is tired. But hear me, we converted the purpose for which Christ come into a personal individual making it. If I make it, I'm okay. I'm coming to church to pray so God can do for me. If I make it, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We don't even think about the salvation of the millions and the hundreds and the tens that are running. We don't. I tell you the truth. We have become numb to the first call. We have become numb to the first purpose. We have become numb to the reality for which church exists. I'm not talking to about the other church brothers and sisters. We are all in the same box. Everybody live for themselves. All our prayer requests for ourselves. What make us lose sleep for ourselves? All our struggle and frustration and discouragement and disappointment is us, me. I'm not happy. Somebody walk on my toes. I'm not happy. You know, it's us. We have lost sight to carry out and carry on on what Jesus has entrusted to us. It's not to live for us. So in November, before I begin to preach on first fruit, the toughest message of my life to bring to a congregation. 
I was in Strathmore for five days. I was praying fasting. Serious fasting. And I had a dream. And somebody come and begin to teach me and talk to me about first fruit. I'm telling you, my heart was so devastated. I woke up, I was not excited because I was scared of you. I'm just being real to you. Because you never heard me preach this thing. It's not easy. In the same dream, I redreamed the same dream that I just told you. I saw myself in the same dream, dreaming another dream. I just turned 51. I'm old enough to dream dreams. <laughs> and I saw myself standing at the window again. But this time, guess what? I was able to open the doors. And I woke up. It was my motivation. Hey. Hey. There is a revival coming in the land. Amen. And we have to be ready. Amen. I say we have to be ready. Amen. When you watch the TV and the weather channel come on and this pretty lady stand up and said, oh, and the screen is moving in front of her. And she goes, next week, Monday, there's a snowstorm coming. We are advising you not to go out. Use snowstorm. In fact, it is the biggest snowstorm since 1954. <laughs> Just because of this woman standing on the screen, reading machines, and prophesying to you based on a machine. Everybody's under arrest. The news goes out. Hey, Monday, be careful. The text, guys, be careful, Monday. You better go do your grocery because Monday is coming. You better make sure there will not be a school. Monday is coming. Do you have your snow tires? Monday is coming. We begin to obey, prepare, set ourselves up because Monday is coming. A snowstorm is coming because a woman said that on the screen. Yet when God stood and said, revival is coming, <laughs> oh my God. People say, no, no, I've heard that before. I don't know about it anymore. I have heard that before. I don't know about it. I don't care how long you've been hearing it. I don't care how many times you hear it. There is a new voice sounding. And I'm about to announce to you an announcement. Revival is coming to the land. <laughs> Hallelujah. The people will be born again. We will reach out, as Pastor JB was saying. We will roll the stone. We have the key to open the doors. We will have our own doors open. So people can come and seek the Lord when he can still be found. Because the time is coming where he will not be able to find him. We must do the work of the ministry. When is still time? For the time is coming where we will not be able to do the work of the ministry. And I told you before, we are at 4 p.m. And in the winter time, that means it's dark already. I have come to tell you from today, you cease to live for yourself. You need to put your excuses aside. It's not about you. I know you have debt. It's not about you. You are sick. It's not about you. My son has autism. It's not about me. Yes. You have lost your job. It's not about you. Nobody likes you. It's not about you. Your husband did not kiss you. It's not about you. Somebody look at you weird. It's not about you. Listen to me. We die today. It's not about you. Amen. Jesus didn't save you for it to be about you. We didn't come to church because it's about us. They didn't welcome me well when I come in. This lady, they were talking, and I just get in. You've been in this chair for six months. You're no longer a guest. Get over it. It's not about you. <laughs> it's true. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I will preach this thing good for myself. Good for you. No, no, I, I, listen to me. Why are we in this for? Yeah, right. Seriously. 
Why? Why are you in this for? Question tag. Each one of us starting here, we need to answer that. Why? Why are you here? Why are we in this? For the miracle it will do for me? So I can be visible a little bit? Why, why are we here? Why? Jesus. Why? And the world is dying. Nobody ever give testimony. You don't hear testimony, I led somebody to the Lord. We live for ourselves. That's not gospel. The gospel did not come to make you richer. Jesus did not come so you become rich for you as an announcement. Jesus did not come so you have an amazing marriage, by the way. Because you can have an amazing marriage being a pagan. And, uh, and, and Jesus did not come to make you rich because you know what? A lot of the pagans are the richest. So it's not about that. Jesus come to save you from your sin. Amen. Matthew 121. You will have a child and you will call him Emmanuel. Jesus, you will call him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. The world is dying because of sin. No doctor can remove that sin. No surgery can remove that sin. Yet us, that God has removed the sin, we are sitting here having party. Who do we bring to church today? Who do we have in our homes to give them the first foundational basis? Who do we have in our mind that we are praying for for their salvation? Declare favor on me. I just need favor. Favor for what? So that my business can grow. Grow for what? I hope it's going to be for harvest. Do, do you get me? Yeah. I didn't come to preach to you today. Amen. I come to talk to you. Because there's a serious issue in the church. And we see that in our families. We are selfish to the core. Selfish. Everybody want to boss one another around. You know what I am? You know who I am? Do you win souls? Then I want to know who you are. You know what I can do? No, no, leave it alone. <laughs> Some of us, we are here because, oh, Calgary is a very future, it's good for the business. Yeah, of course, but souls. We will have these doors open and we'll pray. And we'll seek the face of God. Amen. And we'll make ourselves available. Amen. Because we are the instruments to bring administrative healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, Amen. uplifting people to Jesus Christ. We are the one. No angel is here to do it for you and me. Billy Graham is dead. Do you understand? Some of us has forgotten the callings of the scrambling of too many stuff happening in our lives. Some of them are running the wrong lane. At the Olympic, you're disqualified because there will be no reward for you because you are running the wrong lane. You are bought into somebody else's lane. Come on. I'm speaking to you prophetically. Yes. Some of you, God has called you to win souls with that title. You don't win souls. Some of you, God has called to be an evangelist with that title. You evangelize to nobody. That's why sometimes you feel miserable. Because you have dropped out your first love. Your anointing has been uplifted because you don't win souls. Amen. You don't go soul seed. You don't go minister. Yes. You like too much church and sitting waiting for your time to come. Yeah. 
Some of you think like, you know, going winning soul in the street, you know, I'm out of that now. I up, I'm upgraded out of it. <laughs> Me now, I need a stage. Voila. Set up nicely. No, 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 no. You can have any stage anywhere. Go and start winning soul and you'll see often will line up in your life. It is true. So, we will manage to have a door open. Yes. I won't give you much. I will talk with my board. And when we set up things, I will come and give you more details. Amen. But at the end of the day, this house needs to be a house of prayer for everyone. Amen. Amen. Imagine for a minute. This mama just get a bad news at home and is, she doesn't know what to do. Do you know how much it is hard? Not much in our church because we really do our best to get a hold of a pastor. It's hard. You have to wait three days for an appointment. I don't like that. We want to be able, if this mama just get a bad news, she doesn't need to call somebody. She can come to church knowing it's open. Yes. You, are you hearing me? Yes. She can come home, walk in here, yes. and music is there, and she can cry and hold her head and scream the way she wants, settle the matter on the altar, and finish and go home. Amen. Yes. We should not adapt church to the business lifestyle. Amen. The gate and the doors need to be open, like Ezekiah did. He repaired the doors and opened so the people can have access to the sanctuary. No problem texts you and tells you, I'm going to come in two hours. It hits you. We need to carry this thing through. In a way or another. Without this, days, let's leave it alone. Let's go back to our own jobs and pray in our little homes and then we go to heaven. Our life needs to count for something. There's a reward for those who win souls. Not just on the stage. Personal evangelism. I tell you, we are so backslidden. I tell you, you, you don't even know. The church of God is so backslidden. You know what backslidden is? It's when you walk away from what you were supposed to be doing at first. That's what the distance between you and that thing, it is your backslidden stage. We are so backslidden, backslidden, yet we speak still in tongues. Jesus. And we read the word. And we still study the Greek and the Hebrews, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But yet, this generation have not learned how to trust the Holy Spirit for the salvation of a soul. But daring to step out and walk to a stranger and say, praise the Lord, brother, how are you doing? I'm doing well. You know, I don't know. I'm just passing by and uh, I get attracted to come and talk to you. If you have a few seconds, I would like just to pray for you. Because I feel like there's something that you're believing God for. Do you? I need to respect my dignity. God, God will show me. Ooh, should I go talk to you? Okay. You've been born again for 25 years. God haven't spoken. <laughs> do, do, are you getting me? Yes. We don't build church for church people. We build church so that church people can go win non-church people and bring them. <laughs> you catching me? We don't do first fruit. So we can have now golden walls. No! It is to empower. Yes. So we can go win souls. Amen. And tell them about Jesus. Amen. And tell them the house is open.
Counseling is available. Prophetic is available. Healing and deliverance is available. The place to be loved is available. A place of hope is here. But how will they know if no one speak? Amen. How? No, God will speak in the dream that is the way it does in Algeria. Saving the Muslim in the dream. God will do that in the dream. No, 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 no. If you see God saving people in the dream, it's because he haven't found anybody. Yes. That's not his first style. The first style of God is not to visit you in the dream and, and make you born again. It's because there's nobody. There's no human being. So he loves so much mankind, he has to go in a second way. I don't want God to use in the dream to save these people here. I want God to use me and you. Yes. <laughs> God can give himself crowns. Or reward himself for saying somebody in the dream. <laughs> From today, as Pastor JB was speaking, I want to admonish you all to respond to the sole and ultimate call for every saved, anointed, Holy Ghost believer. It is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every human being that is in the earth that you come to encounter, either in the bus, either in the street, either in the workplace during the break, whenever God gives you that wisdom, we are called to preach the gospel. You don't need to be in a fivefold ministry. This is the call for every believer. But we have become amazing entertaining. the sermon was powerful. I, I got my portion. Hallelujah. I got my portion. Oh, God spoke to me. It's true. Now, what do you do with it? Amen. Now that you get your fix, can you go fix somebody else? That, that's what this is need to be. If not, we are really, we are really playing around. I, and I don't want we play around. Jesus. Everyone here has something to give. Amen. Amen. Everyone. We need to invade the streets. But I don't have the evangelist call. <laughs> you know what, my, me, my call more is to stay in the church, and when you guys bring them, then now, you know, my call is just to pray. Listen to me. We all have the evangelistic call because you are all saved. We all bear the Jesus in us, and the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, we are witnesses. You can tell somebody what Jesus did for you, don't you? You don't need to quote a verse. Can you tell somebody what Jesus did for you? Can you mention to somebody the love of God? How he forgave you? How he wiped all your tears away? Can you tell him how you were crushed and he uplifted you? Don't you know this person need that? Can you at least tell him, you know, can I pray for you? Can I hold you by the hand? What can I bring to you? What can I say? It? What can I embrace? What can I contribute? But no, no, no. Because me too, I have my problem. I am a problem. The Bible says, you know, the blind cannot lead the blind. Uh, and so I need to deal with my issue first. When I will get wealthy and strong and wealthy and strong and special, then and only then, voila, then I will go and start dealing with people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we rebuke that. Because that's not the way it should be. With the little bit you receive, be faithful with it. And God will give you more. I come here to talk to you because we are turning into an open house and we are turning into a dangerous people who will invade the city for their God. You know what we're going to tell God one day when you stand before him? I will tell you the common call of, of all of us. That's not evangelist, Lord is Martin only call. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher, a doctor, a laborer, a mother, a father. I don't care. Whatever we are, we all have our strength in some areas, but the common call is to witness. Is to witness. The consciousness of witnessing have disappeared from our mind. 
We didn't even think about it. We just hear other people talk about it and say, wow, he's such an anointed man, he's an evangelist, he really knows how to win souls. We don't even think it's for us to do it. We need to prepare. When the people come here, we need to know how to handle them. All right? So we don't break them when they are already broken. <laughs> All right? We need to know how to handle them. And we need, therefore, to be trained. Don't think for a second because we are born again, we know exactly how to handle people. You need to be trained. You need to tr be trained to know how to have basic counseling. Not to be an expert. You need to be trained how to lay hand on the sick and pray with faith. You need to be trained how to release a prophetic word to an individual. You need to be trained how to cast out a demon. I'm not talking to the leaders. I'm talking to all of you from the front to the back there. Every Christian needs to have a basic understanding of counseling. Every Christian needs to have a basic understanding of healing or to administrate it. Every Christian needs to have a basic understanding of administrating deliverance effectively. Every Christian needs to have a basic understanding of how to administrate prophecy. These four things, you need to learn it. You know what I'm doing? I am believing more in this word than the lady who announced the weather. Amen. Yes. That's why we need to prepare. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Amen. All this to tell you, we need now to prepare yes. if we really believe it. Yes. I don't want to be proclaiming revival is coming and we live like nothing is coming. Because whatever you believe is coming, it should move you to prepare for its coming. Amen. If you know you're going to get married, don't you prepare for? Yes. When you know you are pregnant, will you prepare for the baby coming? So if we believe revival coming, how will we handle them? Do you think is these leaders only are enough? The whole church needs to be trained. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want my life to count. I don't want to stand before God and then he will say, you did really good. You, you administrated things very well. That's not my calling. I'm not an administrator. There should be no church with an empty chair. Amen. Hallelujah. We should be giving a hard time to our board that now we have no place. What needs to be done? You guys pray and see what needs to be done. Because there is no room to see. We are breaking the rules. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if each one of you win one soul in one month. Marakula Matukaya. Just imagine. Every month you win a soul. You become a soul winner. Yeah. Listen, Bonky is at his end now. Billy Graham is gone. In this season, it's not Billy Graham that we need. It is personal evangelism. Not stage evangelism. Are you here? It's not a stage. It's not now the crusade and have millions. No. It is a personal evangelism where the agents of God are trained and they are very dangerous. They are infiltrating businesses, infiltrating neighborhood, but they are flames of fire. Dangerous. Proclaiming the salvation of Jesus Christ to a dying world. In many different ways. 
before they know they are buying down their mouth is confessing. But how will they do that? We are waiting for Billy Graham to resurrect to come and do a big stage again. We have a big crusade now. At the stadium, let's bring all the unbelievers. Leave it alone. It's a street one. This is like a guerrilla. Unconventional war. We need to act like rebels. Who come in unconventionally. Target and hit and disappear. Target. It's you and me, one on one. Amen. So when we have testimony service, you can stand here, I can stand here, we can all stand here and say, I want this one to the Lord. Now, him too is a winner. Now we have testimonies. Amen. Yes, Lord. It is right to come and testify about the big house God gave you. But I want we add to our testimonies a soul testimony. S O U L, soul testimonies. Yes. I want we begin to share strategies on winning souls. Cell groups spread around the whole city in every place. You know, when I mentioned cell group, I repented to God so much because I always try to do this thing. It never worked. You know, I just tell you the truth. It never worked the way I wanted it. We had cell groups, but they were not the type of cell group God wanted us to do. And it never worked out the way I knew it's supposed to work. I tell you the truth. We have rather... I have a few of them that were beautiful with some young, amazing, new, fire-up believers. But listen to me. Our, our cell group, our discipleship group, I don't want that. Where you gather already people who are mature and then we are gathering and have a good time at home and studying a book. No, no, no. These times are over. Do that. But, but what we want to do here is cell group that wins souls. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, seriously. No, not, a, not a discipleship group. You disciple and re-disciple and re-disciple and disciple again. How many times are we going to disciple people and we never take them to go win one soul? I don't want that cell group. The real cell group need only two people to start. A host and a facilitator. And we're going to have empty chairs and we will pray and believe and invite and groan in the spirit until somebody come and sit and get saved. Then you begin to add to the kingdom. Amen. Cell group is not an opportunity that your big preaching that is in you that you cannot preach on Sunday, now you're going to roar that in the cell group. That's not what cell group is. <laughs> cell group is to win souls. Amen. Not gather people in the church already and take them to your room house and say it's a cell group. That's not a cell group. It's a gathering of good friends. <laughs> Having a good time. And talking about politics and good stuff and Greek and Hebrews. We talk about people meet and they shandalai and pray, Lord Father, we claim the soul of this man. After you meet two weeks and nobody show up, now you mobile the cell. You take those two people, you and them, and you go visit somebody in the house. Amen. Now we're winning souls. Not shoveling, take money from your saving, making it in the checking, and taking the checking, making the saving. You're not getting richer. Yes. <laughs> church is just a movement where believers move from one church to come here. And this church is not different. We are fishing in the aquarium instead of fishing in the lake. Most believers here know more Greek and Hebrew and verses than me. They are three. We need wild salmon. Wild. Who don't even know how to find the book of Job? And you say verse one, say, what is verse? That's what I'm talking about. Real born again Christian fresh. Who's wondering who's Jesus again? And they are born again, they are still asking who's Jesus. But we have people here 
We're going to have a cell group. They will all gather and talk about the deep revelation God gave them and the doctrines and debate. Nobody gets saved. Are you ready? Yes. And if you are not ready, you will be made ready. Amen. Uh, are you hearing me? By force, by fire. Every one of you. I don't care if you just got born again. You will win souls. Amen. You will win souls. I don't care if you never done it. You will do it. I don't care if you never pray for the sick. You will. It doesn't matter if you never prophesy. You will. It doesn't matter if you never cast out a demon. You will cast it out by screaming. You will scream. They will think it's the Holy Ghost, but you are so scared, but the devil will still run. <laughs> Am I speaking to somebody? Yeah. You cast out a demon. You ah! And the, the devil run thinking that you are so powerful, but you are running also. But God has defeated him. Hallelujah. We need to be equipped yes. to administer healing and deliverance, yes. to administer prophecy, and to administer what? Put up, so you're not listening. <laughs> counseling. counseling. Somebody say counseling. counseling. Deliverance. Deliverance. Healing. Healing. And prophecy. prophecy. That is the hope that the world needs. Yes. Not the pastors and the leaders and the board member and the elders. No, 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 no. Every one of you called, born again. Even if it's one day of salvation. You don't want to miss that. You need to be trained. So in the street, you can administer such. Here in the church, you can administer church. So our whole church become a ministry church. Now, imagine if 100 people show up right now here. Drug addict, broken, prostitute. Do you think these leaders sitting here, they can handle these 100? No. No, no, you tell me. Do your mathematics now. Will they? So you're going to sit back and watch. Oh, we're going to stretch your hand just pray. From far. Yeah. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> and then they are doing the dirty job here. Ay, 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 ay. No, I don't care what is your background. This is the time you become very dangerous. Everybody now come. You pinpoint and you begin to minister. They say, eh, in this church, everybody is a pastor. Everybody is a pastor. Everybody is a minister. Everybody can administrate all the four elements I just said. You are qualified if Jesus Christ lives in you. And don't run away from it. It's your opportunity to be prepared. Because the same way the snow is coming, is the same way even greater that the revival is coming. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I am so eager. I'm a very spontaneous person. Bear with me. That's the way I am. And at 51, I won't change that. Because not evil. It burns in me with such a strength. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Can I tell you something? I was so tempted to come this morning. I was come. God made me stay a little bit outside too much. It was cold and then I feel like, ah, it's too cold. I was coming this morning to preach like that a little bit and tell you, put your jackets on. We're going to keep the children ministry. We'll watch over our children. Let's go for 45 minutes shift in the street. Please, don't leave the church now. <laughs> what are we going to go do in the street? Wind souls. Can you imagine a big crowd like that in the city? Yeah. Then the newspaper will show up. They will feel there's a riot. <laughs> and we'll say, yeah, there is a riot. We have come as rebellious people against the devil, demon work here. Yeah. Showing up in the whole northeast and northwest and southwest. This whole, every one of you. But because I don't want to give excuse to any one of you to say I've not been trained or prepared or it's too cold outside, I'll give you one month so we can prepare. <laughs> now, now, don't miss Sundays now because... <laughs> you, you know, as I'm speaking, I remember this vision was given to Heidi a couple of years ago. 
She said how she felt in her spirit that certain Sunday we need just to pack out and go out in the street. As I'm speaking, I just remember that. You will feel so good to pray for somebody. And close your eyes with one eye open, depending on who you're praying for. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Blesses her heart. My dear Margo, who is no longer with us, years ago we went in the street to go minister. And, uh, and we met this guy. And Margo came and said, you know, Jesus loves you. He said, yeah. And you can tell the guy was so excited to see this beautiful lady, right? And he goes, hallelujah. Jesus, she preached to the guy. He said, you need to receive Christ. He said, yeah, I receive Christ. <laughs> I want to receive Christ. And uh, so I'm standing there. And then she's leading the guy to the Lord. And she's such in an emotional move. She's holding the guy's hand like that. And, and she has her eyes closed, right? Just going for it. Thank God my eyes were not closed. <laughs> the guy was so excited, he was that close to kiss her. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> Ow! I have my eye open. I push her back, finish the salvation. I won't break this love story, but it's Jesus you need to love, not this woman. <laughs> He was, a, he was about to kiss her. <laughs> you know, serving the Lord. <laughs> so when you go to pray, this is part of training. When you go to pray for people in the street, never close your eyes. Charismatic people, don't close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. I would like, I took a small group of people. I wish I had more. And we went on a retreat for Friday. And uh, I would like to call Pastor Janie to come and give a few little testimony time. Amen. Can we put our hand for our amazing pastor? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yes. So we went to the retreat for two days, and uh, personally, I am a, an executive person, so God has given me the gift to execute things. So I work, I come to the uh, result. And I've carried for many years, and when God was teach teaching us, um, he spoke about the difference between achievement and accomplishment. And uh, I argue with God a lot, because for me, I accomplish. I want just to accomplish tasks. I just want to accomplish tasks. And I was agreeing with, uh, uh, arguing with him. And he rebuked me. And he said, Jane, it's not about you. Mm. This one is not about you accomplishing things. Jesus. Where I'm bringing my people the people that I will bring in my house, I want you to focus on the achievement. I still argue with God. And then we went on the baptism on fire. I broke down. I broke down. And in my humble heart today, I wanna say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the time that I did not appreciate you for the one person that you have accomplished. Because God told me, my people, you don't deal with my people the way you do in a circular world. You need to appreciate them for the one person that they have accomplished. So it was so tough for me. I cried, I lay down, and I stood up and I ask for forgiveness. And I'm glad that I have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness to all of you that I've worked with. That I did not appreciate you for the one person that you have accomplished. And with the grace of God, I will do my best. Mm. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 31, 21 says, set up road signs, put up guideposts, mark well the path by which you came. Come back again. And this weekend, as uh, Apostle was sharing, was talking about, just like the Israelites set up memorials to mark certain events and things that had happened along their journey. So I, I set up road, road marks in my own life and one of those road marks was set up this weekend in Wester Rose, Fe February 21st to the 23rd. It was, I can't even describe it, and I, I don't want to take time to even, I can't even describe what God did. I thought we were just going there and we we're going to talk about strategies and evangelism, but God did heart surgery on us. It was so powerful. Um, thank God. Thank God we took this opportunity and we, and we went. Um, I share the same sentiments as, as Pastor Jenny. We can't be doing what we're doing. I'm very, too, you know, administrative. And, you know, we, we tend to, we want to get to the end, the, the, the accomplishment, the end of the goal. And in the meantime, we forget that we're working with people. We forget we're working with human beings that have needs. They're not... We're all at different levels, even as leaders, we're at different levels. And I just said, I, I too had to ask God for forgiveness. And I too ask you for forgiveness. If there was anything I ever said or I, anything I ever did, it was not intentional. It's just sometimes you have to be told and you have to be taught. And God did such a work in my life. 2018 was not, it was not good. But I wanted to just describe something to you. You know those, you know those, those spin mops you buy, right? It's like a, and you and you stick it in the, you stick it in the thing, and it twirls it, and it squeezes out all the water. I don't know if any of you ever have one of those, but this is my opinion. They're useless. You take them, you go wash your floor, and all you're doing is swishing around the dirt. You're just swishing around the dirt. It doesn't really clean. You know it's dirty, but if company comes, they might not see it. But all that dirt is in the corner, and all you're doing is swishing it around. And it was like God said, you need to get down on your hands and knees with, with a rag, and you need to wash your floor. I, I only feel my floor is clean when I get down with a rag, and I wash my floor. And so God, God got me down on the floor this weekend and just washed me and cleansed me and cleaned me up because there was just so much stuff. And you know, you think you're okay. You th I thought, no, I didn't really think I was okay, okay. But I thought I was, I was doing better, better than 2018. But I thank God, I thank God for Apostle, I thank God for his, his ministry this weekend. It was so powerful. And God is such a gentle rebuker. He's such a gentle master. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This weekend was very powerful. And I agree with uh, Bishop. I thought that we were just going there for, you know, teachings. So I had my pen and my notebooks. But <laughs> the little did I know that we had, God had an appointment with us. Mm. There was uh, an encounter that I don't even know how to describe it. Starting from convictions. I mean, from the things you say to some of the th stuff that you didn't even know it was in your head. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> it was an amazing. But one of the things that our father spoke that really touched me was the baptism of fire. That most of us, we have been baptized by water and by the Holy Spirit. You speak in tongues. But there is another baptism, which is the baptism of fire. Hallelujah. And fire is able to go to certain mm -hmm. places and parts of your life that will bring out some things. It only would take the fire. Hallelujah. And this verse came in mind. Uh, Jeremiah 20 
verse number 9. And it says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut in my bones. You understand? So, so what Apostle was saying was that uh, there are times where when the fire comes, it removes all this draft out of your body, out of your life, out of your heart, whereby you only seize Christ. Amen. And as he was saying, it's not about you. It is about Christ. Amen. And this morning, God has given me a, a different and a, a new set of mind and perspective. Amen. I am so grateful and I'm so thankful to our Father. God bless you. And thank you so much for pouring out to us and all that was released. I believe there is a shift and there's a move yes. that is coming in this house. Yes. And we can see that it's starting with us. We have seen just a tip of it. And the, the bigger one is coming. Yes. Hallelujah. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so excited. Um, wow, it's a very nice view from up here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this weekend was amazing. Um, I call it spiritual surgery. Like it was literally God breaking me down. I walked into this retreat with a lot of fear, a lot of pain, mm. a lot of um, doubt and worry for something that happened two weeks ago. And I'll share it a little bit. It's more of a personal testimony. So I uh, went to, I, my doctor sent me to do some tests. I went to do the test and the technician, during the test, there were some scans. The technician was telling me the things that was wrong with me. And as you guys know, that doesn't happen, right? It's the doctor that tells you, receives your test results and shares with you, this is what is going on. But as I lay on the bed, he was going on about, oh, you are so sick. You are so weak. Mm. This is what's in your body. This is what's hiding in your body. And I just, I recognized the voice mm -hmm. as the voice of the devil. Mm -hmm. And I started to pray in my head. But honestly, to be honest with you, I was scared. Yeah. I, was, I was like, uh, I look OK. <laughs> I don't look sick. There's nothing happening to me physically. But he was telling me all of these things. And I walked out of that appointment broken. And it planted fear in me. Mm. This was two weeks ago. So I was supposed to have my um, doctor's follow-up appointment on the, the Saturday after. This was a Tuesday on the Saturday. And for some reason, it got canceled. And I was like, oh, God, another week of waiting to hear exactly what's wrong with mm -hmm. me. And um, so I rescheduled it to the Saturday that we were supposed to have the, the retreat, so that's this past Saturday. And guess what? That week, Pastor Jenny texted and said, oh, there's this retreat. You have to be there. I'm like, oh, God, another week again. <laughs> but then I told my husband, I'm, I said, if we were called to attend this retreat, there has to be a reason why God wants us to be there. It's not just by chance. It's not just by coincidence. But God wants me to be there for a purpose. And I had so many challenges at work with uh, you can't take Friday off because I had meetings I had to lead and all that. And I said, I'm going to be there. So some of them saw me working the night before, waking up early on the, sad, on the Friday to work just to make sure that I could give my full attention to this program. So during the baptism of fire, I just laid before God's feet and said, mm. God, the past two weeks, I've been, I've been scared. Like, honestly, I've been reciting scriptures <laughs> and, you know, saying or praying and all of those things, but I was scared, and it was deep down, and, and I couldn't understand. Like, I couldn't sleep. I'll be having nightmares and all of those stuff. So when Apostle told us to take off our garments, we had to de actually demonstrate it. When I took off my jacket, I just felt like God was saying to me that this is it. I'm in control. Amen. Regardless of what, you know, Regardless of what the technician said, whether he was supposed to say it or not supposed to say it, that doesn't matter because I'm in control. Amen. And no matter what I'm going through right now, he's in control. And his greatness, his power, it doesn't mm -hmm. change because some technician who doesn't know his job said all those <laughs> kinds of stuff, right? So I'm just so grateful that he broke me. He actually 
did the surgery in me, took out that fear, took Amen. out that pain. That Amen. night, I slept like a baby. <laughs> um, I was sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag. It wasn't the most comfortable, but I slept like a baby. <laughs> and I think that that's because of God. And I'm just so excited because I know that that would have prevented me from, with this revival coming, that would have prevented me from giving my all if I still had this fear in me that I can be broken and go lead the broken. I have to be whole. Come on. And we talked about wholeness and I felt like God just prepared me. He just told me, you're whole, you're whole, you're whole. It doesn't matter. And, you know, I felt like God moved me from that place of pain, that place of suffering to the right hand of the Father Amen. where there's everlasting joy, everlasting peace, Amen. everlasting happiness. And I'm just so grateful. Um, for this opportunity, and I just want to encourage everyone here. God is greater than mm -hmm. anything, regardless Amen. of what is happening, regardless of the storms, whatever. My appointment with the doctor is this Saturday, and I'm not scared. I'm confident because I know that, you know, regardless of what happens, God is still God, and I just bless Amen. God for that. Amen. Come on now. <laughs> Good, oh, excuse me. Good morning, Cross Point. How are you doing today? Good. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to say one thing that this retreat is for me. And um, I have a reason for saying that. Uh, when Pastor Jenny texts me that, oh, can you confirm if you're going to attend this retreat or not? Um... I said to my son, that, oh, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And the reason being the father, in my mind, I don't think I'll be going. But I said something to myself that, okay, I'm going to send an email to my boss in Ontario. And um, I'm going to ask him that I want to take Friday off. If you give me a condition, I'm not going to go. But if you said, okay, yeah, free, you can go, then that means God wants me to go. Hmm. So, I send the, you know, we have one shot something, and I send it to him that, hey, Brian, you know what? I would like to take Friday off. And just say, oh, sure, Joe, that's fine, take it off. <laughs> just said, uh, out of office so that we're not going to send you five, because they sent five to me through email. I said, oh, wow, well, that means I have to go. <laughs> so, because I've already said, okay, God, if you want me to go, this is the condition, uh, this is the condition, if not to go. So I, I tested back that, okay, yeah, I'll be going. And um, I want to thank God that I did, went for that program because it's for me. Um, the reason why I said this is this. On Friday morning, when Pastor Carl was sharing, I received a revelation right there. Oh, because I normally have, I have a special prayer that God, I want to be 80 years old before I die. Reason being the fact that my father died very young, so I actually prayed that prayer. When he was sharing that thing, God just dropped in my heart that you got to stop praying that kind of a prayer. Hmm. And um, I don't know Bible much. He just said, turn your Bible to uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. And there it was the story of Abraham. When God called him, he was 75 years old. Mm -hmm. And God was telling me that if Abraham has prayed that, okay, he wants to be 80 years old, I called him at 75. Do you know the history of Abraham before 75 years mm -hmm. old? Nobody know. And God started talking to him at the age of 75. And um, he asked me to go to Genesis 25 verse 7. He was still ministering to us. And I quickly go to my addiction because I use tablet. And uh, it's there said that Abraham died at a very good age. And I look at it. Okay. And he died at the age of 175. Mm -hmm. That means in God's book, Abraham was supposed to spend 100 years on earth. And when he was 75, God started with him. And he died at the age of 175. Mm. So there I received my first 
revelation that day. I said, oh, thank you, God. Secret. I'm going to change my prayer. I will die at a very good age. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and the second thing is this. Um, he said, God loves you unconditionally, mm -hmm. without any condition. And I said, God, how? And he gave me an example that your daughters, do you love them because what they do or what they didn't do? Mm. We just love them. Yes. So if you can love your daughter like that, that you just love them, that they do what you want them to do or not, what do you think I am? I'm a loving God. I love you no matter what you do or what you don't do. I said, thank you, Father. That's a very good revelation to me because I received those two things when I was there. And um, the third thing is this. When the apostle was teaching us, I actually think that I'm very humble and I'm a humble person. <laughs> because I, I try as much as possible to give respect to each and everybody. People that are very close to me knows that, that mm -hmm. I actually try to give you respect. But I discovered something which is quite different from the kind of humility that I was thinking of. And it really touched my mind so much. You know, humility doesn't judge. Mm -hmm. You don't assume that this is what guy, this guy is thinking about me, or this is what he's about to do. Mm. If you are humble in art, you don't judge people before they even say anything to you. Yeah. I have a kind of person, maybe, I think very fast. I think fast, maybe, and that's why I talk fast a little bit at times. If you want to talk to me, <laughs> I'm ready there before you get there. So I may not see anything, it's in, in my heart already. So God was just talking to me when they were talking about humility. That don't assume that if someone is doing something, this is his intention. No, don't think like that. If you are thinking like that, that means you are arrogant. You are not humble because you already judge him. No matter what he does, you already have your, your decision. I said, God. A humble person usually seeks reconciliation instead of his right. So I said, God, okay. So no matter what, don't think this is my right, this is my terrain, this is mm. my territory, don't mm -hmm. encroach on my territory, this mm -hmm. is my office, don't come in here and mm -hmm. me. You know, that kind of a thing. I'm the kind of a person that I think that if you try to do something beyond your power, I just try to put you in place right there. <laughs> so don't go there, don't come near me. There's so many things that happened over the weeks that I thank God that I did attend that thing. Amen. It's a very good thing. <laughs> I got a kind of a principle for myself and my kids know that. When I was going home yesterday, I bought them a lot of things because I don't appreciate them much. Oh, I, because I have my standard. I have a lot of things that you've got to attain. That, this is my, you got to be here. <laughs> So it's a very good thing for me that I attended that thing. Mm. And uh, there's so many people in this church I might have probably stepped on your toes by maybe doing something that I feel that no, you shouldn't have done that. I just want to apologize. <laughs> I learned that instead of defending yourself, you should make yourself open to suggestions. Yeah. Welcome people's opinion. Don't decide that this is what I'm going to do. This is the way we should do it. No. That doesn't show that you are humble. At times, there may be a miscommunication. Give people benefit of doubt. Check and check again, like Apostle said. So when people tell you something, you need to check and recheck. Yes. Before you take your decision, before you take your stand. And don't wait for people to come to you and ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You do it first. Don't think you are right all the time. And at the same time, you may not be wrong. 
but you reconcile first. Yes. Ask for forgiveness first. I have to say that to my wife a lot because if anything <laughs> happened, I'm expecting her to come back and say, oh, I'm sorry. So it really broke me down. There's so many things, but this issue of humility is something in my life. It really touched me so much. And I don't know if you are sitting down there. If you say, I can't do this, you are proud. Mm. No, this is not for me. Come on. So you need to check yourself. You need to check what you do. Amen. If you look that you're supposed to do something in the house of God, no, this is not for people like me. Excuse me? You are proud. Mm. That's good. You need to check yourself. Yeah. Amen. So once again, I want to thank Apostle for that opportunity, and I want to thank God for making me to attend. <laughs> and uh, I want to say, I apologize to my family, my kids, and uh, everybody. I love you all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody. Can we all stand up on our feet? Let's all stand up on our feet. Thank you, Jesus. We didn't go to a retreat to strategize anything. <laughs> we went to a retreat so God can do a surgery in our hearts. Amen. We all need an oil change. Sometimes we are so stuffy with so much things and get so much in the routine of things that we don't even realize we need help. Because we're so used to do, to plan, to do. Sometimes God just wants to confront us to the deepest level, into the hidden parts of our beings. Parts even that are not unknown to our conscience. That's why we went there. And I would like to extend an invitation to you. We all need an oil change. No matter how anointed and strong we feel. How will we do? Matthew 3.11 said, I baptize you with water. But after me, come one that I'm not worthy to untie his laces. He, Jesus Christ, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and... With the church knows about the baptism of water. We do it here. The church knows about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Evidence with speaking tongues, manifesting the gift of the Spirit. Word of knowledge, word of prophecy, word of wisdom, tongues, interpretation, healing, and so on. But the church does not know the baptism of fire. It's one of those baptisms we don't like to talk about. We have stayed on Pentecost. We remained on the manifestation of the gifts. A man and a woman who encounter fire by God. There is certain thing you won't do anymore. The reason sometimes we counsel and re-counsel, advise and re-advise, and it seems like people's lives don't change, is not because they are just evil. It's because they have not encountered baptism of fire. When somebody is baptized in water, it is difficult to tell him that Jesus is not. When somebody is baptized in the Spirit, evident was speaking in tongues, it is hard to convince this person that the spiritual realm and the gift of the spirit is just a joke. Until you experience something, you can debate it. But experience is greater than science. So the baptism of the fire, it is a baptism of purification. Where God's hand come upon you, and everything that is you begin to burn. It get consumed. The pride, the lies, the ego, Amen. the unsubmissiveness, the manipulation, the rush way of doing things that does not glorify God. Twisted personalities 
begin to line up. The fear, the anxieties, the depression begin to disappear from the person's life. The fear of man begin to disappear. Baptism of fire purify you. You die. You. You're you. God bring you in the baptism of fire in a face to face with yourself. Without nobody pointing fingers and telling you what is wrong with you. He allowed you to mirror yourself and you behold your ugliness. <laughs> Amen. The part of you that are so repulsive that you yourself have accepted at last. Those are the things that retain us back. God spoke and he said, I will remove the dross from your life. You will be the silver in the hand of the smith that will shape you. Sometimes God is not shaping you for your next calling or your next things because he doesn't want to shape you with the dross mixed with the silver. He said, I will remove the dross from the silver. In other words, he is not removing the dross from the bronze so you can become silver. No. You are already silver, but you carry dross. Yes. There are sinful, evil, repulsive attitude and behavior that are crippled in our life. That we can't even call sin because you cannot list it as a sin. Yet it's evil in the sight of the Lord. Humanism. Crippled within. Personalities. That are twisted. Ungodly. Yucky. Repulsive. Gross. That we've been sleeping with it since we get born. We've been dressed up. We act. We deal with human beings, we go to work, we pass through life. But when revival comes, the people God uses, they have to be dross free. Amen. A face to face with you. Facing you. No more justification. That's why I took this team with me. We went to die there. We went to realize I didn't deal right with these people. I was too harsh here. I was too pity on myself. I was not right here. That's why we went there. We went for a repenting session Amen. with God. Amen. Not to the Catholic priest. To God. We went to leave our flesh there. As Pastor Bishop Michel saw, we left our flesh. We came back spiritual. Amen. In the busyness year of life, we just come to church, a little Bible study. And it crippled on us. It crippled on us. It crippled on us. It crippled on us. I want to challenge you as a body. Let's be real with God, not with men. Please. I want we face and not looking for our glory. Let we look for our ugliness. We are in the dispensation of grace, but I still want we look at our ugliness, of our brokenness. Of our setbacks, of our attitude that is thinking in God's nostril, our rebellious behavior, our pride, our lack of love, our lack of honor, our lack of respect, our hidden behaviors in closets Jesus. that we don't do here in church. And some even do it here. How when we face the truth. And only then the truth can set us free. We are stepping away from the time of justification. 
where we will excuse ourselves and give stories and, and say, yeah, but I did that because you did that to me. You know, I have my right because this is my place. Nobody has a place here. Every position you occupy was given to you. As it was given to you, it can be taken away. And that's implied to me too. Do you understand? That's why we went there. I want to plead with you. Let's be real. Under this atmosphere, I want we sit down and close our eyes. Drop the lights. Everybody sit down just for one minute. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to acknowledge before God that it's not about you. Even when it's not done your way, it's still not about you. I want you to acknowledge before God that even people hurt you, you will release them. I want we open our heart before Him, our brokenness that does not intimidate Him. Our stinky attitudes that are not holy. Even some of our frustration are not justified. Our fears are not justified. Because his love is more manifest. Let us be real in our relationship with one another. Starting in our families. The grudges in our lives. Let him purify your heart from the bitterness. Let him purify your heart. Purify your mouth from bad mouthing, criticizing, killing with your mouth. Let him purify your heart. He has baptized us with the Holy Spirit. Let him baptize us with the fire. The fire of purification. Purify our hearts, O oh God. Burn the dross out of our lives. It's not about us. We ask for repentance. We ask for forgiveness. Where we wrong you. Where we misrepresented you. Forgive your church. You forgive your people. When they have followed their ways and not your ways. Where we have lifted up ourselves above you. Forgive us. Allow us to see ourselves in the mirror. That every man and woman in this place 
mirror themselves that will cease to entertain what is wrong that will cease to entertain what is evil that will cease to entertain what is ungodly that will cease to obstetalize and give place and room to what is not right to what is repulsive let your fire begin to penetrate our bone marrow our smallest thoughts every part of our heart our emotions you died to forgive us that we may live to bring you pleasure anywhere and any place where your church has gone to have pleasure or happiness that does not glorify you lord let your fire penetrate all these evil desires attractions habits twisted personalities let the dross be lifted up let it be well removed oh god as we cry out to you from the depths of our soul purify 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 Lord, we don't want to find our identity in our doing. Purify. Purify our hearts. Purify our intentions. Purify. Go deep within. Go deep within us. Setting every excuse aside. No longer a matter of who fault it is and who didn't do it and who should have done it and who did it wrong and who did it right and who pointed the finger and who started it and it's no longer a matter of who was the victim and why did they do that? Let the fire of the baptism of the Holy Spirit begin to purify you, setting you pure silver, setting yourself on the altar before the Lord. That it may begin to shape you for greater purpose. All the stealers of joy in your life, purifies, purifies, purify, oh God, purify the thoughts. Let a new flame arise with it. Impart the fear of the Lord within our hearts. Visit us with fire. That we may embrace the ways of the humble king. It's not about us. We own nothing. We have nothing. We deserve nothing. It's all yours. It's not about our status. It's not about our office. It's not about our positions. It's not about our ability. It's not about our contribution. It's not about our influence. It's not about us. It's about you. It's about you. Let your fire burn every offense. The dross of offense. We want to live for you. And you died for us. We want to please you. We want to bring pleasure to your heart. In our habits. In our conducts. In our thoughts. In our relationships, 
We want our Papa in heaven to be pleased. We want to bring pleasure out of the purifying fire that have cleansed us, setting us before you. Father, we do not want to continue this way. We don't want to, don't want to continue excusing and justifying. Release today everything to him. Don't hide it from the fire. Make it available to be burned. Even that low self-esteem, it is not his glory. That fear is not his glory. That stubbornness is not his glory. That pride is not his glory. That heart that has twisted ways of doing things is not his glory. That rebellious behavior is not his glory. That unsubmissiveness is not his glory. That disobedience to embrace only your ways is not his glory. That tongue that lies is not his glory. That tongue that manipulates is not his glory. That tongue that insults is not his glory. That tongue that hurts, that crush is not his glory. These eyes that intimidate is not his glory. These eyes that despise is not his glory. This hand that frighten is not his glory. This hand that sin is not his glory. This hand that beat and hit is not his glory. This feet that walk in the path of wickedness is not his glory. Sitting in the path of the scorn is not his glory. Under the fire, nothing is too small. Nothing is excuse. Nothing is to be justify or tolerated God is calling a church that is pure a church that fears him a church that is cleansed without wrinkles without spots God is calling a people who will represent him in stature in character expressing love to the purest expressing wisdom to the strangers God is calling a church that is flaming with joy, that is flaming with love. God is calling a people that will run the race, that will forgive easily. God is calling a people that will embrace the weak, the broken. God is calling a people that are humble. Purify our hearts. Wholeness by fire. Wholeness by fire. Strength by fire. Let we encounter you. We do not want to be the way we are. We hate those parts of our lives, oh God. Your church is crying out to you. Visit me, oh Lord. Touch me deeper, oh God. Go in every hidden maze of my life. Those places where I have never dared to go. Those things that I've never dared to acknowledge. God by fire. Purify our hearts. And your church cry out to you, visit them with fire. And you visited Moses, visit us with fire. And you visit Elijah by fire. Visit your church with fire. Baptize us with flames of fire. Baptize us with purifying fire. Baptize us with shining bright strong fire. Baptize us with truth for oh God. Undress us from the ugly garment masquerade hiding behind and dress us of the heavy garments of the world 
of our heavy and godly evil repugnance characters and dress us and dress us oh God from the heavy garment of fears worries competitions wrong assessing and dress us from everything that keep us away from our next step of glorification and dress us oh God from the very thing that make our prayer not pass the ceiling from the very thing that make our prayer not get to you and dress us from the wickedness of our hearts it's not about you it's not about you it's not about you it's not about you Father, here we are before you. Naked standing before you. Raw before you. We don't know anything. We don't have anything. We don't own anything. We possess nothing. Undress us from the vain battles, from the vain arm wrestling, from the vain rights. We have no rights, we stand before you. Close us with fire. I want you to stand up on your feet now. Close your eyes. And just lift up your hand to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the purifying flames go individually, personally, to each person in this house. And then those who are watching online, you will purify your church. That's what you said. You will purify your church. That's why we came to repent. That's why we came to repent. We surrender. We lift up the white flag of peace. You are too strong for us. Your church surrender. Individually surrender. We want to be like you, Jesus. Shape us like you, Jesus. Shape us like you, Jesus. Let we live our life free from offenses and not holding any grudge back. Releasing every human being into your capable hands. Releasing them free. Make us like you so we do not react. Make us like you so we don't fight back and avenge ourselves. make us like you to forgive those who have wounded us betray us who disrespected us despise us walk on us only by the fire we forgive refresh our spirit refresh the spirit of each person here this morning Renew it. Are you cleaning them right now with eye soap? Nothing hidden. Everything exposed. Nothing kept back. Everything 
exposed. Nothing holding back. Everything exposed. We refuse to keep moving forward with such a weight. We refuse to keep functioning in this manner. We refuse, oh God. Nothing will ever justify that. We refuse. Your grace is available for our transformation. Draw glory from our lives. Let our life be a well where you draw glory and pleasure. Let our life be a well where you draw satisfaction and pride. Visit those who are crippled. Visit those who have been enslaved by the weight and the cares of life. By fire, oh Lord Jesus. I want to be like you. We want to be like you, Jesus. We want to reflect your love. We want to reflect your compassion. We want to reflect your ways. We want to be carriers of the flame of glory. Oh God, purify the lives of your people from the selfishness that they have crippled in, making us the gods of our own lives and the gods of our businesses, the gods of our ministries, the gods of everything you entrusted to us. God, we dethrone ourselves today by the fire of the Holy Spirit. We surrender to you. Humble us, oh God. Lord, we don't want to keep doing what we've been doing. Your people don't want to keep living where they've been living. Relating to one another the way they've been relating to one another. It is evil in your sight. It's sinful in your sight. It's repulsive in your sight. We don't want to live in our houses and in our home without reflecting the flame of glory where you can draw pleasure between our relationship, husband and wife, father and children, mothers and children. God, we want to be a well of pleasure. Humble us to forgive one another in our homes. Humble us to uplift one another. Humble us to surrender to one another. Humble us to understand one another. Humble us to be patient with one another. Humble us to forgive quickly one another. Humble us to clap hands for one another. Humble us to strengthen one another. Humble us to praise one another. Humble us to make a way for the other. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh Father, please. I'm asking you, please do it for each person. The way you did it for me. Lord, I please you. Please do it for everyone here. Please do it for every person. We need a new encounter with you. We need a new departure. We need a new beginning. We need a new flow, a new anointing. We need a new embrace. We need a new warm of the Holy Spirit. We need you. We need a new and a fresh vision of Jesus Christ. We need a fresh vision of our Savior. We need a fresh vision of our Master. We need a fresh vision of our Father in Heaven. We need a fresh vision of Heaven. We need a fresh vision of your ways. We need a fresh vision of your thoughts. We need a fresh vision of your will. We need, oh God. We need. Father, will you please do this for these people? Will you please, Father? Will you please do what cannot be dictated? Do what cannot be taught? 
do what cannot be counseled or advised or discussed or talk about penetrate each heart and renew the right spirit within us in Jesus name in Jesus name if you're married I want you to embrace your wife and keep her in your hand for 10 seconds at least if not walk to somebody 